Hello everyone and welcome back to part four of developing games in Visual Studio using Cocoa Sharp. And in this episode, I kind of want to do two things. I want to look back at some of the changes that I've made to the application from part three. So if you remember, we started building a bouncy ball game and we got the idea of some kind of physics and the schedule loop, which enables us to keep things up to date. And then we had a score that was counting up every time the ball hit the bat. Now, if I just run this quickly and show you what we've done differently or what I've added since part three, I've done a couple of things. One of them, I'll just wait for that to happen. So we've got a bouncy ball here. You notice I've had the concept of lives. So we're counting how many lives we've got. If we miss it, the lives goes down to two and then it kind of carries on here. Another thing I've changed is I've removed the kind of gravity and physics used in the ball. So now it doesn't get slower as it gets to the top. It just carries on at the same speed. And I think for a bouncy ball game, it's kind of easier to begin with because if you have gravity, if the ball starts slowing down, you've got to make sure that it's going to reach the very top of the screen. Oh, missed again. And the other thing that you'll probably notice is that the ball hits the top of the screen now, whereas before it used to go off the top. And the other thing is if I run out of lives, as you can see here, the thing says game over. Another thing just to quickly notice is there's some data here that's been logged into the console. And I just wanted to mention that very quickly. So whoops, should I hit stop? If we go back to here, game layer, this is really where all the changes have been made. So I want to just quickly look at these. You might have already made some of these changes yourself once you learned the basics of how the game is set up. So let's just look at those quickly. The first thing just to mention is that uh, this here was what we saw in the console. And the reason I logged this is I was trying to work out what was happening with position and velocity and frame time in seconds. And I wanted to work out whether frame time in seconds keeps increasing all the time or whether it's the same value. And what actually happens is it's really the time in seconds since the last time that this was called. So most of the time, that's going to be a fairly consistent number. In my case, it was about 100 milliseconds. So what that's saying is the last time this was called was 100 milliseconds ago. And that just helps us know how far to move the ball. So if that was 200 milliseconds, we would move it twice as far as if it was only 100 milliseconds. So that's why I wrote that in there. You'll probably end up doing those sorts of things quite frequently when you're designing your games just to find what's going on. Obviously, if things are getting called too quickly and that thing scrolling through the output, it might not be very useful, but that's the first thing that we want to look at. The second thing is I've added the concept of lives. So we had score previously and I've added lives in as well. So I have an integer here, which I keep track of the number of lives. At the moment, I don't have any way to start the game again. Once that gets down to zero and it's game over, that's it. You'd have to restart the game. We will fix that later on. But for now, we just got three lives. Obviously, you could have as many lives as you liked. And I've just reused the concept of the label. So I haven't added a second label for lives, which you might want to do. So you might want to have score down here and lives over here. But in my case, just being lazy, I've added lives and score to the same string. And notice I use a string dot format to put the right numbers into zero, which is lives and one, which is score. Another thing I've learned is that this font that you get in the demo program is called Marker Felt 22 and there's a reason for that. The reason is it only has size 22 font embedded in it. So you might want to try and make that bigger. I tried to add the game over label as bigger text, but that didn't work. So if you want to do other sizes in 22, you're going to need to find some other fonts and embed them either as this cross platform format or as a format suitable for in this case android so i've modified that i've also added another label for game over so this is very similar to what we did before we create a new label in this case it's only going to have static text on it it doesn't change and in this case i start with visible being false so i can add it as a child to this layer the game layer 
but I can keep it invisible until game over happens, in which case all I have to do is set visible equals true, and then that label is going to appear here. So that's all pretty straightforward. In terms of removing the physics of the game, so if you remember, we used to have this method where what we do is every time we re-enter this loop, we reduce or increase the speed by the value of gravity, just so it kind of mimics a little bit of kind of real life physics that it goes up quickly, then slows down and then comes down quickly again. I've commented that out and I've just given it a fixed velocity of 300 Obviously, again, we could change that. We could make it get faster as the game goes on. We can make it go faster as we level up to the next level. And again, we can look at those improvements later on. So if we go into here, a couple of other things that we've added. So uh, firstly, we've added the handle for if we've got zero lives, then at the moment, I'm not sure how to switch off this kind of game loop. So all I've done is just said, well, if lives equals zero return, I'm sure there's probably a way to unschedule this uh, this loop if the game ends. Actually, what would probably happen is we go back to the title screen. But for now, I've just said, well, if lives is zero, just return straight away. Don't do any more maths because there's no point. Uh, and then further down here, we already mentioned commenting out that. So we just stay with a fixed velocity in the Y direction all the time. And then in the code that we had before, where if the position Y was less than zero, I think before the ball just dropped off the bottom and kind of carried on and then you, you were kind of stuck. So what we do here is we say if the position Y goes off the bottom, which is less than zero. So if you remember zero, zero is down here in the bottom left corner. So going upwards is positive. So if we go down past zero, that means we've gone off the bottom. We reduce our lives by one. We update the label in the bottom left corner because we've now changed that number. And then we just have a little check to say, well, if we have any more lives, then we're going to put the ball back where it starts again, which, if you remember, was where we started here. Otherwise, the game over label comes up and we just return straight away and we don't do anything else. So the ball's not going to come back and that's it. We're kind of finished or we put the ball back where it was. This part is exactly the same as before. So this just says if we've hit the paddle and we're moving downwards, then we reverse it and we increase the score. And obviously the label is updated slightly differently because we have lives as well as score. Ideally, we should probably put this into a helper method just to make sure that we're not having to repeat the same things more than once. But for now, that's less important. The left and the right bounds is the same as before. So that's just checking if it's going to hit the walls, then it bounces back in. But I've now also added a check for the top. And this is a bit simpler than these because we're only talking about one, one direction. We're only talking about the top of the screen because the bottom is already handled here. And we do some code very similar to this, but it's a bit simpler because we're only checking one side of the box. We get the maximum Y of where the ball is. So that's the top edge of the ball. We get the visible bounds of our game and we take the maximum Y value. So that's the top of the screen. And then we simply say if the ball is higher than the top of the screen and ball velocity is greater than zero, which means we're moving upwards, then we just reverse the ball velocity to make it come downwards again. So that's all I've really added. There's nothing particularly magic, but notice that this method is starting to get a little bit bigger. So at some point, we're probably going to have to start extracting these into individual methods just to make it easier to maintain, easier to understand. So we could say, you know, check bottom, check paddle, check sides, check top. So we could do it that way. Obviously, you can slice it up however you like, but that's what we've got for now. And then the only other thing I wanted to mention briefly it was if you remember, I had to hard code these because I couldn't remember which of these properties I needed to get the width and height of the label. So a label is a node and all nodes here have a content size. In this case, I think 
is actually defined in the label so that probably means it does some slightly different maths but node also has a content size so we can get the content size get the width of that divided by two and that just pushes the label onto the bottom left corner of the screen otherwise as i mentioned before the position of every node is actually the center of the node so if we place the node at zero zero we're placing the center of it at zero zero which means things like a label is going to be um, only a quarter on the screen and the other bottom and the left hand side of it is going to be off the screen so by and large that's all i've really done as you can see, just a reminder again, as you're developing your game, there's certain points that you're going to look and say, do you know what? This is getting a bit messy now. It's fine when you're just hacking something to try and work something out. But as you learn to build larger and larger games, you're going to have to learn how to separate these things up correctly so that each class, this is a class here, game layer, each class should be kind of as small as possible. So you can extract some of this logic to a helper class if you want, or you're gonna, we're going to need to start reorganizing things, which we're going to look at now. So just a reminder, if we run this game again, we obviously don't have any pause. But if just to remind you of what we've added, we've added the lives down here in the bottom left, as well as the score. We've added a fixed velocity in the Y direction. So it doesn't speed up and slow down anymore like it used to. It also hits the top of the screen now, which it didn't before, and comes back down. And we've got our lives kind of here on the left. If this goes off the bottom, that lives goes down to two, goes down to one, goes down to zero. And when that happens, game over comes up. And you see the ball stopped because we are not calling this code anymore once we've finished. So that is a few kind of just nice improvements on what we built last time in part three. So let's just close this. I'm now going to open what I've done for part four. And it's part four is based on part three. So you can add these things in as we go along like we were doing before. And what I want to look at really are two things in this part. I want to look at how to um, layer your game in a slightly more consistent way because over time you're going to end up with lots more layers you're going to end up with more scenes and so we want to kind of start separating that out and i also want to look at a couple of different ways that you can set a background image and how you can also scale the game to fit different resolution screens so fairly basic stuff again but easier to kind of take these things one at a time so the first thing i want to do is pop back to our app delegate so if you remember this is where we set the resolution and this resolution here 1024 by 768 is a 4 by 3 resolution that's why our game kind of looks slightly more oblong it doesn't fill the whole screen at the moment so that's all just as it was before but now what I'm doing here is if you remember the previous code in the previous code actually I could probably open that um, open file if we go back to the original part we open our shared app delegate here what we did was we created a scene directly in the previous game passing in the main window and then we added a layer or we created a layer we added it to the scene and then we told the main window to run that scene. So we did it all in our in our app delegate. Now the problem here is we don't really have any flexibility. If we want to do anything clever to that scene, then we've got to end up adding a load of code in here, which starts to get a little bit ugly. And also when we start looking at multi-scenes, this doesn't really lend itself to the idea of having more than one scene. So to actually extract that out a little bit in our latest version, what I've done is I've created a game scene. So game scene is here. We'll look at this. I'm not sure why that's happened. Let's get. We've created a scene, which is going to look at the code in a second, where we're saying, well, for the stuff I want to do in my game scene, let's just do it all in a separate class, which inherits from scene. So rather than doing it all in the app delegate, all I now have to do is create a game scene here, 
pass it the main window just like we did before but I'm not going to set up anything else at this level all I'm going to do is call the main window and tell the main window to run with our game scene so the rest of this at the moment is all the same as before so that's fine that actually makes this app delegate code slightly neater and it means we're starting to move the logic into where we want to actually use it so the game layer just so that you know if I remember correctly is uh, the same as the previous part yes that's right at the moment so all of the changes we're making are going to be in this game scene so what do we do well we kind of do the same as we did before this time however we're creating two layers and hopefully you can understand what a layer signifies if you think of see-through pieces of plastic with pictures on them and you can stack them all on top of each other so the ordering is important the layer that you add first is going to go at the back so in general we're going to add our background layer first and then in our case we've only got two we're going to add our second game layer on top of that so remember we are a scene because we inherit from it so game scene is a scene and within the constructor here, we're going to call the base class so that we can initialize the scene with all of the stuff that the framework does for you. And then we're going to create a new layer. This is just a normal layer. And in this case, I'm going to call a helper method, which at the moment doesn't do anything. So if you see here, all of this is commented out and you'll find out why in a minute. And then we add this as a child to our scene. And because we're adding it first, that's going to be the very background we are still able to interact with things in the background layer if we want to, but if we would have to create um, a, de a derived class like game layer in order to do that, and we would have to have collision detection in the background layer. At the moment, we don't. This is just going to be purely visual. And so we call this helper method, doesn't do anything. We add it. We then add our same game layer as we had before. The only change is... If we remember before, this was a CC layer color. And here, when we did this, we had base and we had CC color, I think, for uh, 4B or 4F, uh, four floats. Doesn't really matter, but I think we had, um, we did something here, didn't we? Um, uh, yeah, we gave it a name. I can't exactly remember what it looked like. In fact, let's open up the other file again, just so that we know what's going on. So if we go back to, oh, where have we gone? Repos, uh, tutorial, part three, da, 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 in the shed. And if we look at our game layer here, so that's what we did. Let's just do that again quickly so we can see why we're changing it. Uh, that is there okay now hopefully that will build and if we run this it shouldn't look any different than before when it eventually runs um, and the reason it won't look any different before is our background layer Although we've added it, it doesn't do anything and it doesn't look like anything. So by default, that layer will be transparent. So this is absolutely identical to the code that we just looked at. So let's go back to our um, game scene and let's kind of bring in some of this code. So initially, what I wanted to show is, is kind of the, the easiest way in which we can set a background image into a background layer. So the layer itself doesn't have any background image handling, but a sprite does. So we can load a sprite from file. And what I've done is I've added some content here. So I've added some tiles. Now, the big one, you'll see what it looks like in a minute. It looks like that. It's not very interesting and it's sideways. But I just did it initially to show you what a large portrait image would look like without actually spending any time making one that looks nice. So we simply load that as a sprite. We set the anchor point 
of that image to be zero zero in other words the anchor point to this is down in the corner not in the middle and that obviously just makes it easier to lay out the image rather than calculating where it needs to go we've disabled something called anti-aliasing and what that's designed to do is to make low quality images look slightly nicer on larger screens it's up to you whether you want to use that or not. In my case, it's not really going to make any difference. But if you want something to look old fashioned, then you tend to disable this. You set it to false and that's just going to make it look very blocky and square, which is what old computer games look like. If you're making kind of a newer game and you want it to look a bit smoother and nicer, then you can compare what this looks like turning it on. It will make certain things look better. Some things look worse, but that's kind of up to you. I've just disabled it. And again, I simply add this sprite as a child node to my background layer. Now, interestingly, if I run this, the first thing that you'll notice is, again, it's not going to look any different. And this is where um, why I recommend that you spend time actually writing this code yourself, trying to work out what's going on and thinking, you know, what? why hasn't this worked? And obviously there's a couple of reasons it might not have worked. It might not have worked because you haven't typed the right code. You might have the wrong file name. You know, all of these things might be wrong. But that's why copying the code from a sample can be really helpful because you kind of look and think, oh, I've definitely copied the code correctly. And this is where you have to remember that these things are added in order. So we're adding a layer with an image in the background. And then on top of it, we're adding a game layer. Now, if you remember, our game layer inherits from layer color, which actually means that this layer isn't transparent. It actually takes on the color that we pass to the constructor. In other words, we're putting a black layer over the top of a layer with a background image. And that's clearly now what we don't want to do. So let's get rid of that. We're now not going to inherit layer color. We're just going to inherit from the normal layer. Make sure that that builds OK. Now, if we run this, hopefully we will see a very unattractive blue background. So let's wait for that. So here you go. If you notice, it's kind of static. There are a couple of tricks that we can use. So some older games are thinking of things like Defender used a, a kind of a parallax trick to make things look 3D. So what you could do, although you can't really do it on this bouncy ball game very easily, but if you were, say, a spaceship, sometimes what happens is as you move the spaceship, say, 100 pixels you might move the background 20 pixels so it kind of makes it look like it's much further away and it's moving much more slowly so you can do that but also if you're doing like a spaceship game sometimes you have like a planet which doesn't move because it's kind of saying well even if you move 10 20 miles that planet's still basically in the same place so you can have multiple layers that move at different rates but just want to show you the easiest way to get an image and one of the things that this does show to us is the fact that we're not filling the screen at the moment. And of course, there's a reason for that. The reason is in most devices, you're going to have one of a number of different screen resolutions. And in fact, if you go to um, Wikipedia and search for screen resolutions, uh, display resolution, there we go. You'll see in this big image here of all the different sorts of devices. So if you've ever heard of things like VGA and SVGA and WXGA, blah, blah, blah. These are what they all mean. And it, as you can see, there are loads and loads of different resolutions. So older devices tended to be four by three, which are the kind of red ones here, as you can see. So we're saying that as the screen gets bigger, we had VGA, we had SVJ, XGA, uh, all the rest of it. So these are older devices tended to be like that. Older monitors and TV screens tended to be four by three. And their most newer screens, newer TVs tend to be roughly 16 by nine. So these are the blue ones here, 1280 by 720, 1920 by 1080 is full HD. And then you've got other things like cinema and stuff, which is, you know, 21 by 9. It's almost twice as wide as it is um, tall. As you can see, trying to support that for your game is going to be really tricky. Uh, but you can do it on Coco Sharp. And if we want to do that, let's just pop back a second to our app delegate and really... It's this method here, which gives you all of the control over it. And it's this screen resolution policy, which is basically saying, OK, I've said 
that I want mine to be that resolution. And if we go back to our screen, oh, it's not showing, is it? If we go back to our, our screen, if we remember, let's bring this up a second and pause it. Or we can just leave it up, actually, wait for it to error. If you can see here, what, what this is saying is, is, well, I want mine to be 1024 by 768, which this box is. But I want to show all of that screen on here, but I don't want you to alter the ratio of width to height. So in this case, the screen's taller. So this option here means don't stretch it, because if you stretch it, the ratio of width to height is going to change, and I don't want you to do that. And obviously, there's a couple of reasons you might want to do that. The most obvious one is that you can control exactly what everything is going to look like on this screen. You can say, well, in this case, I know that my bat is always going to be that wide. It's never going to get stretched wider on a wider screen. It's that, you know, if I stretch is taller, it's not going to take longer for the ball to travel up the screen because it, all the ratio is fixed. The second reason why you might want to use this method is if you're trying to do a retro games console like a, a Game Boy, like a Commodore 64, a Spectrum, whatever it is you're trying to do, they had fixed screen sizes. So they only worked in a certain size. And in those cases, you might want to say, look, I want to be a Game Boy and a Game Boy only had one resolution. So I'm going to set it to fixed and I'm going to do show all. And show all means show all of the screen, but... Um, if it's not the right ratio, don't stretch it. So as you might imagine, there's a whole load of different options here. So some of them would say, well, actually, if you look at fixed height, if we run that one, what fixed height is going to say is that if the resolution, if the ratio is wrong for the size of screen, then stretch it up keeping the aspect ratio but making sure the height fits the device so if you noticed here part of our width has actually gone off the edge of the screen so this would be useful if you had a game that scrolled left and right then you might want to use this because it says well if i fit on the screen then great i don't need to scroll but if i you know if i don't fit on the screen i'm happy to you know squash off the side here and allow the user to scroll left and right. So that's what fixed height is. As you might imagine, fixed width is the same, but this time it says, make sure the width fits in. And if you need to stretch it upwards to fill the height. Now this is, I think gonna look the same as the first one, except here it's put it at the bottom instead, because in this case, the screen's already wide enough. So it's the same width, but if you look here, because our image is not stretched, we're now using the whole height of it, um, but we've um, we've kept the width the same. So that's a slightly different way of stretching it. Uh, and we can do ex what's the exact fit. I can't quite remember what exact fit is. They give them these names, which have, we have to kind of learn what they mean. And uh, bearing in mind, in our case, the the background image hasn't been scaled to fit anything. So you've got to understand what is the actual playable screen. So the exact fit is saying stretch uh, width and height to fit the device. Now, in this case, you might say this still looks OK for a bouncing ball game. You might decide it looks a bit stretched. It's up to you. You know, you're going to just have to make a call on it. But that's the simple way of adjusting it. Another thing you can do if you want to get complicated is you can have different uh, um, resources different entities in these different folders and you could actually do some screen detection to say if the window is in 16 by 9 then actually draw things slightly differently so you could have maybe a menu at the bottom and you can draw the menu taller to fit in with the taller screen and keep the playable screen the same size you could proportionally change things you could make the paddle a different size so you can obviously play around with it but for now um, I mean, exact fit, I think, probably looks OK for us for now. Looks a bit nicer than having the, uh, the letterbox. So we're going to keep that. So that's all great. But I want to show you one last thing here. And that's about how to tile a background. So if we go into here and part four and look at our assets, 
the portrait image that we're using at the minute for the background is 14 kilobytes, which isn't massive. And that's partly because it's a PNG file and it's quite a solid color. It's not massive, but it's still pretty big just to load as a background. And if you think that, let's imagine you had a game where every level had a different background. So some of the bouncy ball games, as they got more modern, they would change the background every time you went up a level just to make it kind of more exciting and to change it a bit. So if you imagine all of those were 14 kilobytes, you're starting to use up quite a lot of space on your app. And certainly on some older devices that are a little bit slower, the processing required to load that image might be significant. You're only going to load it once, to be fair, but it's still potentially quite big. So what can we do instead? Well, what happens if we tile it? Well, a tile is simply, if we double click this, this tile is a much smaller version of that same image, but rotated this way because I actually want to tile it left and right. And that's very small. That's only 2K in size. But if we look here, we can see that this is 64 pixels by 32 pixels. So it's pretty diddy. We could probably make it smaller than that. We could probably make it 32 by 16. Uh, it would look a bit different, but probably that would still work and make it even smaller. Uh, and sorry, yeah, properties, if we look, is actually 1.5K. So it's pretty small. It's just going to take up much less room. And then if we want a tile for each level, then we could get seven tiles or maybe even more for the size of our, of our big thing. But obviously we have to set that up slightly differently. So if we comment out this code and we uncomment out this, and what we do this, this time is we use something called a texture. And the reason we use a texture is because the texture is able to be looped and wrapped inside a sprite. Whereas if you just set the image of a sprite, then it doesn't. So what we do is we create a new texture 2D and we simply pass in the name of the file like we did before. And again, I think you could probably do that as well. And remember, an Android can load PNGs directly. Windows phones, if you still care about them, don't support PNGs natively for some reason. So you have to convert them into that um, XMB format, which is a cross system resource. But we just load that here. We then have to tell the texture to use a linear wrap. And that just means that when the sprite draws the texture, it knows to keep going, keep wrapping it upwards and downwards and sideways until it reaches the size it needs to reach. So we then create a background using that texture and we just pass it into the constructor. So our sprite, remember we loaded images into our sprite directly, but you can actually load a number of things, including, so that's the file name we were using before. You can also create empty sprites just with some um, size and position stuff. In this case, we're creating one directly from a texture. And then we have to do a couple of things. We have to set the content size and texture rectangle, in this case, both to the same size. And the reason we do that is we want to say to this sprite, don't keep wrapping forever because otherwise you're going to end up just using up all the CPU, drawing some tiles that no one's ever going to see. So we only want you to draw the size of the window in pixels. So we do that very simply by setting the content size and the texture rectangle. And then the other thing is, I think we could do a couple of things here. I think we could change the anchor for this image or we can set the position and we'll just we'll try that in a second. But for now, what we've basically done, if you remember, our score label used to be off the bottom corner because the center was the, uh, was the center of the sprite was zero, zero. So again, by moving this up half a screen in both directions, we move this wrapping into the center. And then like all things, we add this background layer like we were doing before uh, into the layer here, sorry, the background sprite into the background layer. So we're just going to check that that works and that should tile the small tile, the one that's sideways, into our game. And so here you have a very, a very twee herringbone pattern. Uh, if you kind of think about this, when you're doing a background tile, what you've got to remember is that these tiles are going to go next to each other. So you need to make sure that the the right hand part of the image matches the left hand part of the image so that these work. Now, this is a, a pretty nasty looking texture. 
it's, it's very simple. What you usually do is, let's go back to the file system. What we usually do, if we take the original tile here and open it with something like paint.net, is we do it really big. So if we look at the size of this image, this is 1024 by 768. Notice it's the correct resolution, but really when you create these tiles, they have to be a multiple of uh, a two's power number. So 1632, 64, 128. And that's just because of the way they tile. Uh, I did read that somewhere. So this is not quite the right size, but if we actually resize this now, uh, 1024 would be okay. But 768 is not going to be OK. So this would need to be uh, 512. Uh, let's just do 512 and uh, resize it that way. So that makes it slightly wider. I'm not sure if that's exactly correct. But the nice thing about doing a really large uh, image like this is you can take a, you can make a lot of detail. You can make it 3D. You can make it look really cool by using the various drawing tools. But then once you're done, you can then resize it in here down to say 32 by 16 or whatever and let the drawing package decide what that means for all your nice 3d edges and your you know your 3d stuff so you could get um you could paint a line in here maybe at i don't know two pixels but uh, that's probably a bit uh, a bit thin so let's say we kind of did something like this we could you know, kind of make that look a bit 3D maybe. Um, and by using this to resize it, then by the time it gets small, it might that might or might not stay. Uh, it might look rubbish when it's small, but, you know, you can kind of play around with all that. So we do it really big. We shrink it then down to really small and then we tile it. So that is how we do a tile background. And I just wanted to double check because I haven't actually tried this. If I did background dot anchor point uh, anchor point is a cc point so equals new cc point zero comma zero so i think this will hopefully do the same thing but we'll find out uh, it's all the fun of waiting it to deploy to our virtual machine yeah, so that's going to work in the same way. So that's probably a slightly neater way of putting an image in the right place without it, you know, without having to kind of offset it to move it into the middle. So that's pretty straightforward. We've got a tiled background. We could do other stuff to this. And again, we might look at that later on. Uh, you could animate the layer. You could say over time it shifts up and left and down and right and whatever, just to kind of give it a little bit of, of movement. It could maybe shake a bit when you destroy the tiles. But, um, but that's pretty much it for now. In the next part, I'm going to look at um, probably adding some tiles, which we need to do initially. And we're going to look at how we optimize the drawing of those images, because one thing, particularly as your games get more and more complex, the amount of drawing that you do starts to slow the game down. And if you imagine a, a little war game that's got bullets flying and enemy players running around, all the rest of it, that's a lot of drawing that the that the system's trying to do. And rather than taking your every single draw all the way down to the graphics layer and coming back again. Uh, what you can do instead is you can draw everything onto a screen in memory and then just send the whole screen in one go. And that makes things a lot quicker. So it's called texture mapping and using texture sprites. We're going to look at those next week and we're going to start to draw some little blocks for our ball to smash. So hopefully that was useful. Any questions or comments or whatever, then please chuck them in the comments field below. Otherwise, I will see you in part.